So as you just heard, I'm Phil. And you might remember me from such things as the David Hasselhoff exercise experience that sparked rave reviews such as, now I have experienced the Hoff. And it also ignited, uh, uh, ex it ignited uh, uh, talk within Twitter uh, such as, I'm confused. He's from Austria. Now I'm even more confused. <laughs> All of those statements are true, by the way. But I'm not here to talk about Hasselhoff. There's enough time for that in the Q&A afterwards. I'm here to talk about Docker. Who here uses Docker? <laughs> OK, a handful of people. Who here knows what Docker is? OK, uh, more than a handful of people. Who loves Docker? Who hates Docker? No one? Well, the first time that I heard Docker, I hated it. I hated it from the bottom of my gut. It was such a fiery hate that I didn't even know I was capable of. Why did I hate Docker so much? Well, because it was something new, again. At that time, I was working with AngularJS, and I had thought that I had reached the peak of web development. I sort of started to understand what the difference was between a service, a factory, and a provider, though in retrospect, I still have no idea. And I thought that I had learned it all. I had amassed as much knowledge as I could, and the next 20 years were just going to be smooth cruising with everything I knew. And then there was something new again. So what did I do? Well, I did what any good engineer would do. I ignored it. <laughs> and while ignoring it, I, I sort of started thinking about how I had come into the web and all these new things, learning about new libraries. And, and I realized that every time that I learned something new, sure, it was a bit painful at first because you have to learn it. But in retrospect, it made my life so much easier. With tools such as jQuery and then Backbone and now Angular, I can do things that I couldn't do without. And so I thought, well, fine, I'll give Docker a try. And I did. And I'm really grateful that I did because I love it. So what problem does Docker solve? The problem that shipping code is just too damn hard. And uh, we experienced this in our startup about half a year ago when we launched a new app. It's a pretty simple app, but there were a bunch of components to it. There was, for example, the Django backend. There was the database. There was uh, uh, stuff like the front end, the workers, the email component. There was the WordPress public page. There was the admin backend. There were all these components. And generally, that's a good thing, because you want to have everything in components. Otherwise, you have this one big block, and pff, well, that's a pain. And so we had all these components, and I was working on these components on my machine. And so all of these components ran on my dev machine. I'm not alone in the team, so all of the components also ran on my teammate's dev machine. And so we hacked away furiously nights and weekends and power drinks and ah, cue crazy music. And we finally finished the product, and we're like, yes, we're going to deploy it now. But then we had to spend a week configuring production, making sure that every single one of these components ran on the production system. And once we had done that, it was a lot of work, but we got it to run, it was deployed, it was live. Once we had done that, we realized, ah, we, should really, we really need a staging server. And so suddenly we had to configure each one of these components, make sure that each one of these components ran on the staging server. And then we heard this crazy talk about testing, and apparently testing is cool or not so cool or something. But we decided to jump on the train, and then we had a Q&A server in our office, and we had to make sure that each one of these components that we wanted to test ran on that machine. And this is a pain, because each one of your components, you have to make sure that it runs on each one of your machines, on each hardware that you have and will conceivably have somewhere down the line. But we fixed it, we, we, we did it, it ran everywhere. We thought we had it made. And then along came Dave, the unpaid intern, and he brought with him a dingy little Windows netbook, and then we had to make sure that everything ran on his dingy little Windows netbook. And it drove us crazy. That is why this matrix is aptly called the matrix from hell. And it's embarrassing. As an engineer, it's embarrassing that something like this is th that hard. We're engineers, we're scientists, we're supposed to be fixing things and not struggling with these simple issues. And what's really embarrassing is that other industries have solved this. 
For example, the shipping industry. If 100 years ago you wanted to ship a piano from here to Singapore, you had to make sure that every single person along the line that touched that piano knew how to care for the piano, knew how to handle the piano. Nowadays, it's a lot easier if you want to ship something from somewhere to somewhere else. Why is it easier? Because the shipping industry decided upon, created a shipping container. And the beauty of a shipping container is how easy it is, how simple it is. It's just a box, but it's a standardized box. Everyone knows what size it is, what weight it has, how the doors work, where the lock goes, how you can pick it up, how much you can shake it before you break it. It's a standardized box. Mm -hmm. And so all the service providers along the path, they standardize for this one box, and it makes life easier. Wouldn't it be great if we had something like that for software? Well, now we do, with Docker. Docker defines a standardized box for your app. And right here, I want to throw in a disclaimer that uh, Docker is not the only container solution out there. There's a bunch of other solutions that do similar things with containers and something that's sort of like containers. Docker is not the only one. But it is, at the moment, the most popular one, and the one that I really like. And the second disclaimer I'm throwing out there, number one, Docker is not the only one. Number two, Docker is a company. They have employees, they have an agenda, they recently backed 100 million in funding, so they're here to stay. And, uh, but they are a company. As far as I can tell, they're doing everything right. Docker is an open source project. It's a very active GitHub project. People are, are contributing, it seems to be working. But they're still a company. In a year's time, they might screw up. They might do something that I don't agree with. For example, they might institute a policy that you have to be mean to kittens. They might say, every time you see an orphan kitten, you have to kick it. And, and I don't agree with that. You might, which I don't judge, but I don't. And it's not a problem because, I mean, the kitten kicking sort of is. But for the technology, I don't think it's a problem. Because it's such a great technology that it can live on with or without Docker. And so, as I mentioned, I think they're doing everything right, but it is a company. And I mentioned that they defined, they standardized a box for your, for your software. So the one big question is, what's in the box? Well, it's your app. It's your app and everything it needs to run. So that's your code, that's your runtime, that's your libs and bins, everything your app needs. You might be sitting there now in your fancy chair, and you might say, why should I care? Well, Mr. or Mrs. Fancy Chair Sitter, let me tell you why you should care. Because with Docker, you don't just ship your code, you ship the entire environment. And that is awesome. That has a lot of advantages. The one big advantage is that it's the same everywhere. If it runs on your dev machine, it's going to run on your server. And it's going to run also on Dave's dingy little Windows netbook. It's going to be slow, but it's going to run in exactly the same way, because it also contains the environment. There's a great separation of concerns. Me, as a dev, I'm in charge of everything inside of the box. My friend, Jason, who's a sysadmin, he takes care of everything outside of the box. Well, provided he'll still speak to me after, after he sees the title of my talk that he should be fired. Uh, what other advantages are there? Well, there's minimal setup costs. Getting Dave on board is now a matter of half an hour, not half a week. And this is just an added bonus that I really like. Your environment can now be versioned. What that means is all of the advantages that Git brings for our code, we now have for our environment. Yes. So if I want to try out a library and I screw up, I can just step back one version. So you might be sitting there once again and saying, OK, you know, now I sort of start caring a little bit. But it sounds an awful lot like this other solution called virtual machines. And I'm like, yeah, it does. There are some similarities. But let's take a look at the difference between virtual machines and containerization, such as Docker. In virtual machines, we have a server. Uh, that server has hardware, obviously. It has some sort of host OS, probably a Linux. And then there's this layer that enables the virtualization. On top of that, you have a couple of virtual machines. They're all in their own little virtual machine. You can run a couple of them until the hardware gets too slow. And those contain your app. They contain all of the libraries. And they contain an operating system. I love virtual machines. I use them daily. But let's take a look at how containers are different. So we still have the hardware. We still have the host operating system. But then one big difference is that directly on top of the native host operating system, we have the containers. 
And the second difference is that the containers do not contain the operating system. And that, for me, is good news. Because as I mentioned, I'm a dev. I take care of everything inside of the box. If the operating system is inside of the box, that means it's my responsibility to update and maintain it. I'm a developer. I'm very bad at updating and maintaining Linux on production machines. I don't want to patch the newest SSH something or another because who knows what did something. I'm really glad that the operating system is not inside of the container. And I was reading this when I was doing research on Docker back when I was getting into it. And it was sort of like, yeah, okay, so there's a difference and something's there, something's not there. But the one thing that really drove the point home for me was when I did the following. First, I checked on how many processes were running on my normal machine, which at the time were about 235. Well, that's not about, that's exactly 235. And then I went to see how many processes run in a container. And it was just one. And that was kind of weird because I ran the ps command, which checks on processes in the container, and the ps command had the process ID 1. And I was like, whoa, that's weird. Normally you get this really long list and then you have to grep and you have to search for the one process that's going wrong. And here it was just the one process. And then I realized containers, they don't run the whole operating system with everything simultaneously, multitasking, who knows? They just run one task, one process or process tree. Containers only run the one single component. And I was like, whoa, that's kind of cool. I mean, at least it's different. And Wow, that was a really good endorsement. At least it's different. You should use it because it's different. And so then I was like, okay, so I see the advantage. I see how it's different. I, I, I want to use this. And I decided to give it a spin. The first thing you have to do is install it, obviously, as with almost anything. If you're using Linux, that's awesome. You just use your Linux coolness and you install it and that's great because you're using Linux. If you're more sane and you use Windows or OS X, uh, you download an installer from the Docker homepage, and that does your stuff, and then you can use Docker. The thing there is that Docker uses a technology called Linux Containers, LXC for short. And that's a feature that's been in the Linux kernel for about a year. And what it does is it allows for the sandboxing of single processes. So you don't, you don't really need to know all of that. But the thing is that Docker uses technology of the Linux kernel. And on the Mac or on Windows, you don't have a Linux kernel lying around. So if you do the Docker install, then it will install a small virtual machine with a Linux kernel, and Docker will actually use that, and then you'll be running Docker inside of the small virtual machine. And the first time that I read that, I was like, this sucks. I'm not going to use that. What? It installs a virtual machine so I can run something else inside of something else. I'll just use Vagrant or something. But once you have it set up, it's actually pretty transparent. You don't have to worry about it. You, you're not like, okay, so this uses that, that uses that. It's just something to be aware of. Docker uses stuff from the Linux kernel, and the installer installs a small virtual machine that you don't really need to worry about that runs the Linux kernel. The easiest thing is, of course, if you're using a Mac, there's a new GUI available. It's currently in a, a, a beta, so it's not yet final release. But it's pretty cool because it has buttons. And it makes things easy because you just click the buttons, it sets everything up for you, there's a nice little progress bar, and you're like, yes, this is the future. And so you, you can use the GUI, but you don't really have to. So we have it installed. What's the first thing we want to do? And this is usually the hardest part of trying any new technology. You're all cool, gung-ho, you download it, you install it, and then it's like, uh, I, what do I do now? So seeing how it's containers and images, let's run one of these bad boys. And we could build a container ourselves. We could start from scratch and hack it all up, and it would be our beautiful baby, and we'd be happy forever. But instead of investing all of that work, we can use one of the many pre-made containers out there. Docker runs something called Docker Hub, and it holds currently about 50,000 pre-made images. So for example, if we want to run an image with Node, because we want to use Node to process stuff, there's 2,500 images available for Node. Seeing how it's uh, community images, 90% of them are not going to be very good. But that's OK, because that still leaves 250 solid Node images we can choose from. And if you're using the GUI, like you probably should, it's pretty easy. You type in the thing, you click the button, it does everything for you. But if you're a cool kid, 
and you like the console, then you can do it like the following. So you can first search for what you're looking for. For example, right here I'm looking for node. It'll list all of the node images available. And then if I want to run or install one of them, all I do is say docker run, and then I have the name of the package. In this case, it happens to be node, which is the official node package from Docker itself. It tries to run that for you. It sees that it hasn't been downloaded yet. It downloads it, installs it, does everything for you. Yes, success. And then you get a little message that says, OK, container ran. And you're like, oh, well, pff, that was exciting. What do I do now? So I've installed it. I have a container. And I want to do something with it. The first thing that I like doing whenever I get a new system is to, to open a shell, and then I can ls, and then I can cd, and then I can remove stuff. And, and I don't know why, but that makes me happy. So let's see how to do that with a container. With a normal virtual machine, you would probably just SSH in, and you do it via network and expose ports. With containers, it's a bit easier. So you could still do that if you really wanted to. But it's easier, because all you really need to do is start a shell in the container and then interact with that shell. So right here, for example, I'm running, um, I'm running a, a, an image called Ubuntu. And in that image, I start bin bash, so I start the shell. And suddenly, I have a shell available. I'm root because I'm awesome. And then I can ls and cd and rm, rf, and do whatever, and then screw it all up and re-download the image because it doesn't work anymore. So what can I then do with the image apart from breaking it? Well, because in this case, I downloaded an Ubuntu image. That means that I have the binaries from Ubuntu available for me. For example, I could use apt-get. And I could use apt-get to then install a package like git. And this will install git within the image. It will install it within the container. So then I set up my, my node and my git and everything that I need to develop. And then I need to, or I want to, start writing code. Well, I need to because it's my job. So how do I start writing code? Well, I could put my code into the container, and then I could VI and do the whole console VI thing and the old school, which is kind of cool. But, but I'm sort of getting older. I'm, I'm, I'm over my VI phase, my rebellious VI phase. I want to use a proper editor, a proper IDE. So I want to have my code outside of the container, but I want to have my runtime inside of the container be able to run that code. And the way to do that is to share folders. Or if you're a Linux geek, it would be called to mount a volume. Pretty easy to do. Whenever you run it, you add the dash v, and then you say whatever the folder on your host is, then you map it into the container, and then that folder is available within the container and outside. And yes, I have code on the desktop, because that's how I code. That's how I can keep track of my code. So well, otherwise, it just gets lost. So then, for example, if we ls in the container, then there will be the files uh, available from that source app. Sorry, that's desktop app. Um, so the files are available within the container and outside of the container, meaning the runtime can run on all the code changes that we do. And on the outside, I use my IDE to actually edit the code. So we share folders. And I have everything set up. I'm all happy. I'm hacking away. Suddenly, my work colleague comes over, and he says, well, that's a pretty cool setup. But you know, I, I sort of want the setup too, but I'm lazy. Can't you just give it to me without me having to set up everything? And I'm like, I know what you mean. I'm lazy too. I got your back. So what you can do is you can save the image. And that's pretty straightforward. First, you take a look at what image is running. In this case, I only have the one image. Then you commit that image, which basically takes a snapshot, or in Docker lingo, that's uh, create an image from it. And then you have that image. You can either take that file and give it to him by a sneaker net disks, USB stick, or you can upload it to Docker Hub, the pre-made images we saw before. You can host it there privately. You can host it within the team. Or if you feel benevolent, you can share it with the public. And so then we were working on this project together, and we finished it. Now it's deploy time. So how do we get it to production? Well, seeing how this is Docker, it's luckily really easy to do. Depending on what service provider you use, it's really, really straightforward. You did the hard part. You put it all inside of a box. So for example, if you use something large like uh, Google, Amazon, or Rackspace, or if you're so inclined, Microsoft, <laughs> using Docker is straightforward, because they all speak Docker. All you have to do is give them the box, and they will run it for you. 
It's all really straightforward. And that is the real beauty of it. Not only is developing great, but it's also awesome to then actually deploy it. And it's the same there. So I, I, I made sure that it ran on my dev machine, and it will run in exactly the same way up on the server. If any of this has piqued your interest, then uh, I made a cheat sheet for you that you can download. There's a couple of commands in there where you can play around with it, give it a whirl. And I, I generally, I highly recommend you do, because I'm convinced that this is technology from, for, to the future. It will be something that we'll be using, just like we use Angular now. I think, I'm convinced that this will be a fixed part of our tool set, and I'm sure that we'll be the better for it. Thank you.